Turn in your Bible to the book of Genesis chapter 37. And if you noticed, we're skipping chapter 36. And there's a reason for that. Chapter 36 records the genealogy of Esau. And though there's several interesting tidbits in that chapter, I really don't think it's worth uh, the time that we would have to spend to try and dig those tidbits out of there. So we're just going to skip chapter 36. But before we do that, let me explain why Esau's genealogy is included in the book of Genesis. Because a whole chapter is devoted to Esau's genealogy. So why is it included? Well, it's included for two reasons. First of all, it concludes Esau's part of the story in the book of Genesis. So we're completely done with Esau after chapter 36. He's out of the picture. We're not going to hear about him anymore. Secondly, it shows the fulfillment of God's promises to Rebekah. If you remember, when, when Rebekah was pregnant, God told her that two nations were in her womb, two peoples. Not one, but two. And of course, we understand what he was saying. In other words, both sons would father a nation. Esau would be the father of the Edomites, and Jacob would be the father of the Israelites. So chapter 36 is included to show the fulfillment of that prophecy to Rebekah. But we're only interested in the development of one nation. What nation is that? Israel. Why are we only concerned about the Israelites? Because of that prophecy right after the fall. The seed of the woman... The Messiah who would come and take away the sins of the world was to come through Abraham's seed and then down through Isaac, and now we've learned through Jacob. So we're only concerned about Jacob's descendants. So after we have chapter 36, we forget about Esau, and every once in a while the Edomites will come up in the history of the Israelites, especially when they come out of, the ex or out of Egypt in the Exodus, but we've forgotten about, at this point, Esau. So, hold your place in Genesis chapter 37 and turn to Romans chapter 9, verse number 5, and I want to show you why we are so concerned about the Israelites. It says, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are their ancestors. And Christ himself was an Israelite as far as his human nature is concerned. And he is God, the one who rules over everything and is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. So as you can see, our focus is on the descendants of Jacob, not Esau's, because the Messiah, Jesus Christ, was an Israelite, a Jew, and not an Edomite. And that's why we're going to skip chapter 36. If you want to read through it, go ahead and read through it because you'll see a lot of eponyms. Remember what an eponym is. It's something where maybe a place or a, a river or a hill or whatever is named after a person. And we find out that there are many people that tribes or rivers or mountains were named after that person. So there's a lot of eponyms in it. Anyways, turn back to Genesis chapter 37 and let's read verses 1 and 2. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilah and with the sons of Zelpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now I want you to notice how verse number 2 begins. It begins with, these are the generations of Jacob. Now, in our Western culture, whenever we see the phrase, these are the generations of, we expect to see what? A genealogy. But in the East, that phrase can be used to introduce a new section or material. There could be a genealogy after it or not. And most of the time, not. Most of the time, that phrase is simply introducing a new topic or a new subject. And in this case, the new subject is Joseph. So from this time on, the rest of Genesis is all about Joseph with two exceptions. Chapter 38 and chapter 49. Chapter 38 is the story of Judah and Tamar. And chapter 49 records the blessings that Jacob bestowed upon his 12 sons. When I say blessings, I want you to understand he gave blessings to his sons, not the blessing. Only one received the blessing. But besides those two chapters, the rest of Genesis is all about Joseph. So he starts off with, these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph being 17 years old. He doesn't tell us he's going to give us a genealogy. He just wants us to know all of the new material we're going to be reading from here on out 
is going to be about Joseph. Now, notice in verse 2 that the story of Joseph begins when he was 17 years old. At 17, he was working in the fields as a shepherd. He was considered to be a man. And his flock grazed and watered in the same vicinity as the flocks of four of his half-brothers, the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah. So we're talking about Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. Now remember, Bilhah and Zilpah were concubines. They were not legitimate wives. So Joseph, by virtue of his birth, held a higher position of authority and status. That's very important. And that's why Jacob would have had him working alongside of them rather than along the son, alongside the sons of Leah. Joseph was being prepped for his future leadership role in the family. And the pecking order would have been clearly understood, especially in that culture. The sons of the concubines were subservient to the sons of the legitimate wives. They were no less sons, but they understood their position. Now, that's kind of hard for us to understand because we don't understand that culture of polygamy. Remember, it was never God's will. Because God is speaking to them over a period of 1,500 years, I'm talking about the Bible, it, it has uh, over 40 different authors, God is giving his revelation out in little pieces. And we're told in the book of Acts that there were times before all of this revelation was given that God winked at sin. In other words, he overlooked it. So he allowed certain things to exist that really weren't his will. Now, during that period of time, he still gave them laws regulating those things, even though it wasn't his will. But in that culture, they had multiple wives and they also had concubines. The sons were legitimate, of, of the sons of the concubines were legitimate sons, but they still were subservient to the sons of the legitimate wives. And you need to understand that. Because Joseph is placed with the sons of the concubines. And the reason he is placed there is because they automatically know, even though he's the youngest of them, with the exception of Benjamin, and Benjamin's only about two years old, we're going to find at this time. What's interesting about it is he's placed in a position where his other brothers are subservient to them, and they know the pecking order. Now, look back at verse number 2, and I want you to notice what Joseph was doing. These are the generations of Jacob, Joseph being 17 years old, was feeding the flocks with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Joseph was reporting back to Jacob and updating him on what was happening in the fields. And it wasn't good. He had to give Jacob an evil report on his half-brothers. Now, some people read this, and they think that he was being a tattletale, but he wasn't. You see, Jacob, or, or Joseph had an obligation as a keeper of his father's flocks to keep his father informed as, the, as to the condition of his flocks and also to the situation in the fields. And this is the reason that he's reporting back to him. To him. It's to let him know that... These things are occurring. This is how your flocks are doing. And he's doing a great job. So this is put in the story to let us know that at 17, Joseph was a man of integrity. He was responsible and he was a hard worker. He took his job very seriously, even if it meant being a whistleblower on his half-brothers. Which brings us to verse 3. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. Now, to be honest with you, this is one of the most misunderstood verses in the entire Bible. In fact, most people think that this is so clear you can't misunderstand it, but just the exact opposite is true. That's why I say this is one of the most misunderstood verses in the entire Bible. Because this verse sounds like Jacob favored Joseph because he was born to Rachel, who was his favorite wife, and because he was the baby of the family until Benjamin came along. So he was Jacob's favorite. And even when Benjamin came along, Jacob was still treated like the baby of the family. He was special. And his father treated him special, and that's why all of his brothers hated him. How many of you think that way when you read the story? Be honest. Yeah, that's what you've been taught by your Sunday school teachers. That's the way you read it, right? 
That's the way I always read it. That's the way the pastors taught it. Evangelists will preach on this story and they'll bring this out. But I want you to understand, once again, we completely miss what this verse is saying because we're Gentiles. And we're reading this from a Western culture mentality. So why Jacob loved him more than his other children and why he made him a special coat goes right over our head. We think we know why, but we really don't. We think it was because Jacob was playing favorites. But I want you to understand something. Jacob was not playing favorites. So let me show you what this verse is really saying. Look at verse 3 again, and I want you to underline the word loved. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. That word loved is translated from the Hebrew word ahab, and in this context, it means to favor. So notice what verse 3 is saying. Now, Israel favored Joseph more than all his children. So most of you are thinking, well, pastor, you're just proving the point. Jacob was playing favoritism. Well, let's find out why he favored him more than all of his other children. Look at verse number three again. And this time, I want you to underline the phrase, son of his old age. Notice what it says. Now, Israel favored Joseph more than all of his children because he was the son of his old age. Now, if you translated this verse literally from the original Hebrew, it would say this. A son of old age was he to him. Now here's what I want you to do. Pull out a pen, open up your Bible to this verse, and I want you to write this in the margin. This is the literal translation from the original Hebrew. A son of old age was he to him. That's a literal translation. So Jacob favored Joseph because he was a son of old age. And that doesn't mean what you think it does. You think it means that Jacob was much older when he had Joseph than he was when he had his other sons, right? Yeah. We read that and we think, ah, oh, Joseph was the son of his old age. Jacob was so much older when he had Joseph than he was when he had his other sons. But people, that's not true. Not true at all. If you remember, Joseph was born where? Was he born in Canaan? Joseph was born in Haran. In fact, Jacob had 11 sons and one daughter in a period of about six to seven years. Let me just remind you of the story. Jacob runs to Haran in order to allow Esau to cool off. Mama says, you'll only be there a little while. When Esau cools off, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to send someone to you so you can come back. So he goes to Haran, to his uncle Laban's, and he explains the situation. He tells him everything. He says, Mama's going to send someone to me. Well, no problem, because that side of the family is very rich. Laban remembers that. So he says, come on in. Treats him like family. But a month goes by, and no messenger comes. And Laban's sneaking. It's like, it's not right for you to be here and, and, and doing things for me without being paid. But really what he's telling him is, hey, you can't stay here for free. You're going to have to work for your keep. So set your wages. Well, during that month, time, that month period, he fell in love with Rachel. So he says, I don't want any money. Here's what I'll do. I'll work as an indentured servant. If you'll give me Rachel's hand in marriage, I'll work for seven years. And Laban thinks, boy, that's a good deal. And so he agrees to it, but he doesn't give any specifics. He says, you can marry my daughter. He doesn't say Rachel. So Jacob does what? He works for seven years, and then they're ready to have this big wedding feast, and they do all of the, uh, the festivities, and it comes to the nighttime, and they've been really giving him a lot of drink. So he goes in to the bedroom chambers, and it's very dark in there. He's had a little bit too much to drink, and he finds his bride, sleeps with her, and the next morning he finds out, lo and behold, it's Leah. This wasn't what he agreed on. He's living. He goes to his father-in-law and says, wait a minute, this is, what, this is not what we agreed on. And Laban said, hey, that's not our culture. You can't marry the younger without marrying the older. In fact, he's implying, you know, 
our customs. And so he says, I'll tell you what. If you'll finish out this week of festivities, the bridal week, then at the end of it, I'll give you Rachel's bride, if you work for me another seven years. And so Jacob agrees to it. And at the end of that week, he gets Rachel. So now he has two wives after seven years. But he now has them, so he begins having sex with them. And right off the bat, probably from the, the wedding night, Leah conceived. And boy, she starts having babies, right? Rachel can't get pregnant. And she gets mad. So she takes her handmaiden, and she says, here, have children. And she becomes a concubine, Bilhah. And she has children through Bilhah. Remember, Sarah did the same thing with Hagar. Then Leah sees that because Rachel's all upset and she's not allowing Jacob to sleep with, with Leah. So Leah says, here, you take my concubine. You won't let him sleep with me. At least you can have uh, my handmaiden. So she becomes a concubine, has sons. And then finally Rachel gets pregnant and she has Joseph. Now, the scripture tells us in Genesis chapter 30, verse number 25, shortly after Joseph was born... Jacob goes to his father-in-law Laban and he says, I fulfilled my seven years. I want to go home. Now, wait a minute. He didn't have wives for seven years. He worked for Leah. And then he got Leah and Rachel. Then he had to work another seven years. But shortly after Joseph was born, he went to Laban, Genesis 30, 25, and says, I want to go home. Seven years has passed. Joseph is the 11th son. Jacob has had 11 sons and possibly a daughter within a period. And the reason why I say six years is because it takes nine months, right? In a period of six years. Now, think about this. There's only about a six to seven year difference. And really, take out the seven. There's only really about a six year difference between Reuben and Joseph. Now see, most of you... Because we live in this mon monogamous society, we see 11 sons and we think, oh man, Reuben must have been 35 when Joseph was 17. We think that, what, 11 sons? But we're not thinking polygamy. We're not thinking concubines. So when we hear that Joseph was the 11th son, we naturally do the math because of the culture that we live in and we go, man, Reuben must have been twice as old as Jacob. I mean, as Joseph. But no, there's only about a six-year difference because shortly after Joseph was born, Jacob fulfilled his seven years, and he goes to Laban and says, I want to go home. And Laban says, you're too valuable. What can I do to make you stay? And he stays for another six years. But Joseph was born before that six years. Now, Benjamin, on the other hand, was born in the land of Canaan. Remember, Rachel died as a result of him. He was born breech. She had a hard thing. They could tell it was a boy before he was completely out, which tells us he was born breech. He was the baby of the family. Now, we don't know for sure when he was born, but in all probability, he was born about 15 years after Joseph. So when Joseph was 17, in all probability, Benjamin was about two years old. He's a toddler. Now, if this phrase... The son of his old age is talking about the numerical age of Jacob when his children were born. Benjamin would have been the son of Jacob's old age, not Joseph. But this phrase has nothing to do with Jacob's age. Let me say this again. This phrase, the son of his old age, has nothing to do with Jacob's age. In fact, it has nothing to do with Jacob at all. It has to do with Joseph. You see, this phrase, the son of his old age, and that's really not the right translation. I gave you the literal translation. This phrase, son of old age, is a Hebraism. Now, we normally pronounce it Hebrewism around here, so if that confuses you, it's the same thing. It's a Hebraism. It is a Jewish figure of speech. It literally meant old for your age. So in the margin of your Bible, you need to underline son of his old age. You need to put the literal translation and say Hebraism. It literally meant old for your age. In other words, a son who had wisdom be beyond his years. So it was used to refer to a wise son. So that's what the phrase son of old age means. It means Joseph was wise 
beyond his years. Or as the Jews would say, he had the wisdom of an old man in a young man's body. He was literally a son of old age. Son referring to a young man and old age referring to the wisdom that's associated with old men. Old men. See, as we get older, we should have more wisdom because we've learned by experience. We've learned what happens when you do certain things and it's not good. We learned the good things that happen when you do the right things. And so as we get older, we should be getting wiser. So this became a a Hebraism, a Jewish figure of speech. A son of old age simply meant that he was a wise son. He had the wisdom of an old man in his young body. So notice what verse 3 is really saying. Now, Israel favored Joseph more than all his children because he was wise beyond his years. A son of old age was he to him. And he made him a coat of many colors. So, Jacob favored Joseph because of his wisdom. Not because he was Rachel's son and Rachel was his favorite wife. And not because he was the baby of the family. He wasn't the baby of the family. Benjamin was. There's only a six-year difference between Reuben and Joseph. Possibly seven, but really there couldn't be seven because if she conceived on her wedding night, talking about Leah, Reuben's the firstborn, there's going to be a nine-month period. Is there actually ten? But anyways, you're talking about most of the year. And then when his seventh year was up, before he went to Laban, Joseph was born. So we're only talking about a six-year difference between Joseph and Reuben. So if Joseph is 17, how old is Reuben? Oh, come on. 23. 17 and 6 is 23. Now, why is this important? Because we have this Western culture mentality. We see things things through Gentile eyes. So we're reading through the book of Genesis and all of these stories are disconnected. We don't understand why the story of Dinah was put in and we have to learn that Simeon and Levi were cruel. We don't understand why we have to know about Reuben sleeping with Billa. But all of these stories tie in together because we have to understand why Joseph's going to receive the blessing. We have to understand that there's an evil report on the sons of the concubines. And we need to know that Jacob wasn't playing favoritism. In fact, that's what upset him about his father Isaac. Everyone and their dog knew that Esau didn't deserve the blessing and Isaac was still going to give it to him. That's what parents of a problem child do. He wasn't going to do that. But the Jews reading these stories, by the time we get to Joseph, we hear that he's 17. The Jews are reading these stories, and they understand this Hebraism. He's a son of old age. He's got the wisdom of an old man in a young body. At the age of 17, he's got the wisdom of someone who's 70 or 80 years old. There's a reason why he's reporting back to dad and he's giving an evil report. Why? Because he's wise. So, Jacob makes him a special coat. Look back at verse 3. Now, Israel favored Joseph more than all his children because he was wise beyond his years. That's what that Hebraism means, a son of old age, an old man's wisdom and a young man's body. And he made him a coat of many colors. Now, what's up with the coat? Does anyone know? I mean, we, we've made plays out of this. Didn't Donny Osmond, didn't he star in The Coat of Many Colors? I mean, there's movies made out of this. And what do we picture when we think of this coat? We think of almost like a bathrobe down to the knees and it has stripes of many colors, right? Is that what we think of? Yeah. Well, what's up with this coat? Why is this such a big deal? Because this plays a prominent part in the story. This really ticks the brothers off. When he is sent to go check on them and to check on the flocks. Why is he sent? Because he's a son of old age. Jacob's already prepping him. He's going to be head of the family one day. 
You've been over your sons of the concubines because they knew the pecking order. But now I'm going to recognize you. And you're going to have to start checking up on your older brothers too. So when he sends him out, they can see him a long ways away because of this coat of many colors. What's up with the coat? Well, let's find out. First of all, the phrase coat of many colors is a horrible translation. In fact, well, let me go, not go there yet. Let me just show you what this comes from. That phrase, coat of many colors, is translated from two Hebrew words, kehotheneth and pasim. The word kehotheneth refers to a robe or an outer coat. And pasim means ankles and or wrist. It doesn't mean colors. That's an interpretation, not a translation. But you're going to understand why they interpreted it that way in just a minute. But they interpreted it a coat of many colors because of the word passum. But it's not because that's what the word passum means. The word passum refers to ankles and or wrist. So the phrase kefaneth passum referred to a long-sleeved robe or coat that went all the way down to the ankles. So it was long-sleeved, and it went all the way down to the ankles. Now, these type of robes or coats were not worn by common laborers. A common laborer wore a sleeveless robe that went to his knees. Here's a picture of what a common laborer would have worn, especially shepherds. And all of Jacob's sons are what? Shepherds. That's what they do. They're nomadic shepherds. They haven't owned land up to this point. They purchased land, Abraham did, in order to bury their dead. But they're nomadic shepherds. Their wealth is in their flocks. So I want you to take a look at this because this is what a shepherd would have looked like. This is wintertime. You see this poncho? This poncho has a hood on it. But underneath it would have been what they wore in the summertime and the wintertime. The only difference is this is showing short sleeves. And really they wouldn't have worn sleeves at all. Why would you not wear sleeves if you're a common laborer? Because you're working with mud to make bricks if you work in that area. Or if you're with a shepherd and you're working with animals, you're going to have to help bird them and stuff. You're going to get it filthy. You're going to have to carry animals. You're going to have to do all of the different things with them. And as a result of that, you couldn't have sleeves. You want to be able to wash your arms off very easily. Now, as I said, this is a winter picture. So what they would do, if you, if you actually worked outside, you would have this sleeveless robe, and then you would have this poncho-looking thing that was over it. So if you were a shepherd and you had to take them to water. It's the winter time. It's very cold. You're going to take them out. You're going to do what's necessary, and you're going to sit down and cover your feet. You're going to put this poncho over you. You're going to put your arms in, and you're going to be warm. But why did you need to have short sleeves or no sleeves at all? Well, the reason a common laborer didn't wear a long sleeve robe down to his ankles is because a robe to his ankles would keep him from being able to move the way he needed to move. It would restrict his movement. And the sleeves would become filthy, and many times they would tear, and it wasn't for the type of work they had to do. So the only one who wore the type of robe that was made for Joseph was the overseer or master. Now, these type of robes became a symbol. They were usually white with Bright colored stitching around the neckline and the cuffs. That's why they interpreted this phrase as a coat of many colors. It didn't mean that the whole robe had all these colors. They were normally because of the heat in the land of Canaan. If you go to Israel, you'll understand in the summertime. It was usually white, but there were many colors embroidered, embroidered around the neck and around the cuffs. So it was referred to as a coat of many colors. Now, this is where it gets really interesting, and you need to understand this. It's important. This type of coat signified that a person was the leader, overseer, or master of the family clan. So the leader of the clan had a coat like this. And normally the firstborn son was given a coat like this, but not until the father was ready to recognize him as being worthy of the birthright. So by giving Joseph this coat, it signified that Joseph was being given the privileged position of preeminence over his brothers in the administrative affairs of the family. In other words, it signified that Joseph was being appointed to receive the birthright. 
We don't have to wait till chapter 49 to see it. And every Jew would have understood this when they're reading this story. <gasps> he got the coat of many colors. So now we know who Jacob chose to inherit the birthright. The coat tells us. That's why the coat is so significant. If you read through the Old Testament, usually when someone's anointed to do something, they anoint them and then what do they do? They always put a coat over them. Always do it. Why? Because it's a uniform. It's a status symbol. It signifies their position of authority and their rank. Now, immediately, this caused major problems between Joseph and his brothers, as you can imagine. First of all, you had Reuben, who was the firstborn, so he should have received the birthright. Now, you need to remember, 11 sons have been born within a period of six to seven years. Closer to six years. So even though Reuben is the firstborn, I mean, all these brothers are very close to the same age. But Reuben is the firstborn, so he should have received the birthright, but he forfeited his right to it when he slept with Bilhah. Now remember, he didn't do it out of lust. He did this as a calculated move. After Rachel died, Reuben was afraid that her concubine, Bilhah, would become a legitimate wife. And he would take her and she would take the prominent position. She would actually take Rachel's place. And the reason that would be allowable was because Rachel had died. Leah's concubine, Zilpah, couldn't do that. Why? Because she's a concubine, but she's also the maid servant of a legitimate wife. How many of you remember the story of Sarah and Hagar? Sarah can't have children, so what does she do? She says, take my maidservant, Hagar, and you have a child upon my knees. In other words, she's going to have a child in my stead. She's going to be a surrogate mother. And so Hagar gets pregnant, and then Hagar gets uppity all of a sudden. She's young, Sarah's old. She thinks, I got a tight body. Sarah doesn't. But actually, we find out she was beautiful in an old age, so she probably still had that. But anyways, she's pregnant. And Sarah's not. So she gets uppity and she gets to thinking of herself as a wife. Sarah goes to Abraham and says, look at the way she's acting. You need to do something about it. And Abraham says, you do what you want. Sarah goes into the tent and she beats the dog out of Hagar. How many of you remember that? You remember the story? Yeah. So I want you to understand something. As long as Leah's alive, Zilpah can never be a legitimate wife. She can never take the place of one of the legitimate wives, and take a, a place of prominence. But now that Rachel's dead, Bilhah can. And Reuben looks at this, and he's only a man of about 23 years old. And he understands the hurt that Leah's always had. Now that Rachel's dead, he's afraid for his mama. So what does he do? He goes in, and he has sex with her purposely. Because once he does that, daddy can never, never have sex with her again. So that's a calculated move. But not only that, it's a calculated move on his part because he's 23 years old. you got all of these other sons, and they're all coming into this point. He knows the birthright is his, and Daddy's kind of getting owed. He hasn't made these decisions like he should have done. He's not ruling with, the, with an iron fist like he used to. Look what Simeon and Levi did. So I need to come in and assert my right to the birthright. So by sleeping by her, with her, he kills two birds with one stone because the person who received the birthright also had to take care of the mothers of the legitimate wives, never had sex with them. But the concubines of his father became your concubines, and the way you verified your position was by having sex with them. You weren't supposed to do it until the father died. But here he is, 23 years old, and he's going to assert his right. And it backfires on him. Jacob is livid. How dare you try to assert your leadership and force me into giving you the birthright. For that very reason, he forfeited his right to the birthright. Simeon and Levi weren't worthy of the birthright because of their cruelty. The reason we have the story of Dinah. Why would you throw that in? We're only concerned about how the Israelites are formed. We want to get to the story of the Exodus. Why do you throw Dinah in? Because we need to understand why Simeon and Levi are disqualified. They're cruel. And we saw how cruel they were in the story of how they slew those at Shechem. Issachar and Zebulun were hard workers, but they weren't the sharpest knives in the set. And we find that out when we get to chapter 49. Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher 
were sons of concubines. The only way they could receive the birthright was if it was a last resort, resort, because you couldn't do that, or you didn't do that in that society. But Joseph, the son of a legitimate wife, was a man of integrity, character, and wisdom beyond his years. He was what? A son of old age. He was a young man with the wisdom of, a, 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 of an old man. So at 17, daddy realizes Joseph at 17 as the future recipient of the birthright. And that's why he's given this coat of many colors. But he's only 17. And he's the youngest with the exception of Benjamin who's probably about two years old. Now, I want you to think about this. You've got 11 brothers here. Six years difference between them because we're talking about four different mothers from one man. Lots of competition. Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, they didn't like Joseph because Joseph had blown the whistle on them. Every time they didn't do what was best for the flock, every time they were playing around and they weren't doing what they were supposed to, Joseph went to daddy and said, they're not doing what they were supposed to, and Jacob came out. They didn't like Joseph, tattletale. Nope. He's a man of wisdom doing what he was supposed to do. Reuben didn't like him because he was the firstborn. And now he's not going to receive the birthright. And lo and behold, the youngest, with the exception of Benjamin, is going to receive it. Simeon, Levi, Iskar, and Zebulun didn't like him because they were being passed over. And the birthright was going to be going to their little brother. So even though Joseph deserved it, his brothers didn't like it. Now, eventually, their dislike of Joseph is going to turn into what? Hatred. Pure hatred. And it gets to the point that they want to murder Joseph. But Reuben and Judah step in. And Reuben kind of vindicates himself. And Judah is actually going to receive a reward for what he did. Now, his wasn't good. All he did was keep him from being killed. He's the one that suggested they sell him into slavery. But he's going to be rewarded for it. Because the seed of the woman is not going to go through the one who receives the birthright. It's going to go through Judah. Interesting. But that's how bad it became. And that's the reason we wanted to focus in on those three verses. Because now this starts this whole ball rolling in the life of Joseph. 